There's been another mass shooting in America, this time in a community college in Oregon. That means there are more American families, moms, dads, children, whose lives have been changed forever. That means there's another community stunned with grief and communities across the country forced to relieve their own anguish and parents across the country who are scared because they know it might have been their families or their children. I've been to Roseburg, Oregon. There are really good people there. I want to thank all the first responders whose bravery likely saved some lives today. Federal law enforcement has been on the scene in a supporting role and we've offered to stay and help as much as Roseburg needs for as long as they need. In the coming days, we'll learn about the victims, young men and women who were studying and learning and working hard, their eyes set on the future, their dreams on what they could make of their lives. And America will wrap everyone who's grieving with our prayers and our love. But as I said just a few months ago, and I said, a few months before that, and I said each time we see one of these mass shootings, our thoughts and prayers are not enough. It's not enough. It does not capture the heartache and grief and anger that we should feel. And it does nothing to prevent this carnage from being inflicted someplace else in America. Next week, or a couple of months from now. We don't yet know why this individual did what he did. And it's fair to say that anybody who does this has a sickness in their minds. Regardless of what they think their motivations may be. But we are not the only country on earth that has people with mental illnesses or want to do harm to other people. We are the only advanced country on earth that sees these kinds of mass shootings every few months. You know, earlier this year, I answered a question in an interview by saying, the United States of America is the one advanced nation on Earth in which we do not have sufficient common sense gun safety laws, even in the face of repeated mass killings. And later that day, there was a mass shooting at a movie theater in Lafayette, Louisiana. That day. Somehow, this has become routine. The reporting is routine. My response here at this podium ends up being routine. The conversation in the aftermath of it, we've become numb to this. We talked about this after Columbine and Blacksburg, after Tucson, uh, after Newtown after Aurora, after Charleston. It cannot be this easy for somebody who wants to inflict harm on other people to get his or her hands on a gun. And what's become routine, of course, is the response of those who oppose any kind of common sense gun legislation. Right now, I can imagine the press release is being cranked out. We need more guns, they'll argue. Fewer gun safety laws. Does anybody really believe that? There are scores of responsible gun owners in this country. They know that's not true. We know because of the polling that says the majority of Americans understand we should be changing these laws, including the majority of responsible, law-abiding gun owners. 
There is a gun for roughly every man, woman, and child in America. So how can you, with a straight face, make the argument that more guns will make us safer? We know that states with the most gun laws tend to have the fewest gun deaths. So the notion that gun laws don't work or just will make it uh, harder for law-abiding citizens and criminals will still get their guns, it's not borne out by the evidence. We know that other countries, in response to one mass shooting, have been able to craft laws that almost eliminate mass shootings. Friends of ours, allies of ours, Great Britain, Australia, countries like ours. So we know there are ways to prevent it. And of course, what's also routine is that somebody somewhere will comment and say, Obama politicized this issue. Well, this is something we should politicize. It is relevant to our common life together, to the body politic. I would ask news organizations, because I won't put these facts forward, have news organizations tally up the number of Americans who've been killed through terrorist attacks over the last decade and the number of Americans who've been killed by gun violence. And post those side by side on your news reports. This won't be information coming from me, it will be coming from you. We spend over a trillion dollars and pass countless laws and devote entire agencies to preventing terrorist attacks on our soil, and rightfully so. And yet, we have a Congress that explicitly blocks us from even collecting data on how we could potentially reduce gun deaths. How can that be? This is a political choice that we make to allow this to happen every few months in America. We collectively are answerable to those families who lose their loved ones because of our, our inaction. When Americans are killed in mine disasters, we work to make mines safer. When Americans are killed in floods and hurricanes, we make communities safer. When roads are unsafe, we fix them to reduce auto fatalities. We have seatbelt laws because we know it saves lives. So the notion that gun violence is somehow different that our freedom and our Constitution prohibits any modest regulation of how we use a deadly weapon when there are law-abiding gun owners all across the country who could hunt and protect their families and do everything they do under such regulations doesn't make sense. So, tonight, as those of us who are lucky enough to hug our kids a little closer, uh, are thinking about the families who aren't so fortunate, I'd ask the American people to think about how they can get our government to change.
and should be given credit because out of everybody running, I'm the one person that said don't do it. And in How fact, do you put Bush, troops in Iraq though, but not in Syria. I mean, well, there, because there is I'm no saying, border essentially look, between those countries. Let Syria and ISIS fight. Why are we? Why do we care? Let ISIS and Syria fight, and let Russia. They're in Syria already. Mm -hmm. Let them fight ISIS. I look, I don't want ISIS. I don't want ISIS. ISIS is bad. They're evil. When they start doing with the head chopping and drowning of every, these are really bad dudes. So I don't want them. But let them fight it out. Let Russia take care of ISIS. How many, pe how many places can we be? So essentially you're uh, saying let Russia take care of ISIS. If, if Vladimir Putin wants Bashar al-Assad to stay because it makes sense for him, you're okay with so that. So I've watched him a lot. And I've made a lot of money watching people. You know, deals are people, okay? People say, what is, what is a deal? How do you make good deals? It's all about analyzing people. So I've watched Assad, and I've watched a little bit on the other side. The problem is the other side of Assad, we have no idea who they are. Hmm. So they probably are ISIS. I'm saying, are we better off with Assad? We have no idea who these people are. We give them weapons, we give them ammunition, we give them everything. Mm -hmm. Aaron, we have no idea who, I mean, maybe it's worse than Assad. So what are we doing? Why are we involved? Mm -hmm. We have to get rid of ISIS, very importantly. But I look at Assad, and Assad, to me, looks better than the other side. And, you know, this has happened before. We back a certain side. That side turns out to be a total catastrophe. Russia likes Assad seemingly a lot. Let them worry about ISIS. Let them mm -hmm. fight it out. Mm -hmm. Now, in Iraq, we have to do it. We shouldn't have been there in the first place, but we left the wrong way. When Obama took us out the way he took us out, that was a mistake. We should never have been there in the first place. So uh, when we talk about the Middle East, you know, you've been critical of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, but unlike some, you haven't said you'd throw it out. You said you'd make it a better deal. Well, that's I'm, what a, you would... I'm a person that's a business person. So you, you just would, can't it would do improve that. the deal. But, but Aaron, with that being yeah. said, and you've known some of the deals, I, I bought into really bad contracts knowingly. And I bought them cheap because they're bad contracts. And I've taken those bad contracts and make them, I've made them great. I've made a fortune. What you have to do is this. I will analyze that contract so strongly. I will go after it. And believe me, if uh -huh. they violate that contract, they have problems. But what they've done is they have totally out-negotiated us. The fact that they get $150 billion, the fact that we have the 24-day wait period, and it's actually much more than that. Before we can inspect, yes. Oh, no, it's crazy. Uh -huh. I mean, 24 days before we can inspect? The fact that they self-inspect, and how about the prisoners we don't get? We don't get anything. There's one other thing that nobody talks about. If Israel ever attacks, if they ever attack Iran, there really is a clause in there the way I read it, and I'm pretty good at this stuff, we're supposed to protect Iran from Israel. I mean, we're supposed to fight Israel. So That's not going to happen. We're supposed to fight. How do they allow a clause like that in there? Hmm. So it's a horrible deal. With that being said... I will police that to a level that they will not believe even exists. So Hassan Rouhani just uh, said something which, uh, about the GOP, insulting pretty much all of you. He said uh, when some of the, what the Republican candidates are saying are laughable. He said, I'll quote him, some of them wouldn't even know where Tehran was in relation to Iran. Some of them didn't know where Iran was geographically. And that's pretty harsh. Yeah, I don't know who he's you, talking about. So but, you but would can know I where Iran what? is on the map. But, what do you say but, to him? but let me just tell yeah. you what I say to him. They have so out-negotiated our people, because our people are babies. They have no idea what they're doing. I don't know why Obama wanted to make this deal so strongly, because he lost on virtually every point. They will find out. I know he's not talking about me. They will find out that if I win, we're not babies. There's no more being yeah. babies anymore. Who's One of the, the great problems. Well, you got so many of them that are doing so poorly that didn't expect to do. Rand Paul is doing horribly. You know, he was supposed to be a, a leader, and he's down to 2%. Uh, you have so many. A guy like Marco Rubio is a lightweight. I can't imagine that he goes anywhere. You have, who, by the way, has the worst voting record in the United States Senate. He's got, got the worst voting. attendance record. You can't do that. You've you got to vote. You know, people elect you to a position. You've got to vote. Uh, Bush, sadly, I mean, he's, I think he's a nice guy, but he's doing very poorly. I mean, all of these people. The interesting thing is everybody that's attacked me, Bobby Jindal, um, Perry, every single person that's got Senator Lindsey Graham, I mean, in South Carolina, I'm at 34, he's at three, and he's the sitting senator from South Carolina. But all of these guys are out, even Walker, and I think he's a nice person, but he attacked me, I attacked him, he left the race. So, so far, attacking me has not been a good idea. I'm not saying they it's shouldn't do now. it. <laughs> Well, so far it's been, I mean, seriously, five people, every single person that's attacked me, 
is either gone or, I mean, they've either collapsed. Like in the case of Bush, he was at 22, 24, now he's at 6 or 5 or something. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. Look, I'm doing this simply. I want to make America great again. I'm really good at things. I do get along with politicians. I w believe it or not, I have a great temperament for this kind of stuff. They do respect me. In this building, I have some of the largest Chinese banks in the world, and they're very happy to pay me rent every month. And yet I'm very critical of China, which is sort of people say, how can that be? He's so critical, and yet he's got... So when people say the temperament question, this is a guy who'll call someone a loser, he'll say something, and they say that well, that's childish. Campaign. But they say that that's childish. Right. They say that's not the temperament of a president. Probably is a little childish, but you know what? This is a campaign, mm -hmm. and usually, and I think you know this better than anybody, I'm responding to them. I'm a counterpuncher. I think in every single instance I've hit, for instance, Walker was very nice to me. All of a sudden, he hit me, and I hit him back. Uh, all of these guys, uh, Rubio was very nice to me. Couldn't have been nicer. All of a sudden, a week ago, he started hitting me. I so hit you're saying I, you're not going to talk about a Vladimir Putin no, calling him a loser that. or I'll, something like that? I, I actually president? say the opposite. I will. I guarantee. I think I would get along very well with him. We were both on 60 Minutes last night, mm -hmm. Putin and Trump, and it was interesting. I think I'd have a good relationship with him. We have a horrible relationship with Russia right now. We have a horrible relationship with China, even though he's here now. And you know, look. What they're doing to us is amazing. What China is doing to us is one of the great thefts in the history of the world. What they've done, they've taken our jobs and our money. And now we're whining and dining them over in Washington. And I don't mind that, but they have to understand, we have to renegotiate. We cannot continue to have U.S. trade deficit with China of almost $400 billion a year. We can't do that. That's going to end. Mm -hmm. If I'm there, that's going to end. So yeah. I think my temperament is great. You know, I built a great company, and it's because of my temperament. Jeb Bush and Hillary, almost in the same day, they said, we don't like his tone. I said, tone? They're chopping off heads. They're drowning people. We have people in the world that are looking to kill us. We need a strong tone. We don't need that soft, soft group of people. We need something tough. I think I have a great temperament. Now taxes. His GOP rivals, Vladimir Putin, ISIS, and even Bill Clinton. The economy is going to just be absolutely like a rocket. It's going to go up. Let's go out front. And good evening, everyone. I'm Aaron Burnett. Out front tonight, my exclusive sit down with Donald Trump. He is still on top of the polls, and today he rolled out a tax plan promising massive tax cuts for millions of Americans. He tells me it will make the U.S. economy go up like a rocket. Wow. Here's the bottom That's line. The plan would cut income taxes for everyone, with the richest Americans going from paying 40 to only 25 percent of their income, and apparently 31 million American households will go from paying something to nothing at all. Well, earlier, I sat down with Mr. Trump at Trump Tower. We talked about the tax plan. We also talked about the polls and the war of words he's engaged with uh, in, in with nearly every single one of his rivals. People say the temper in question. I say, look, this is a guy who'll call someone a loser. He'll say something, and they say that well, that's childish. Campaign. But they say that that's childish. Right. They say that's not the temperament of a president. Probably is a little childish, but you know what? This is a campaign. Right? So you're I, saying I, you're not going to talk about a Vladimir Putin no, calling him a loser that. or something I'll, like that? I, I actually president? say the opposite. Tonight, our entire interview, we begin, though, by talking money. I asked Trump how he will pay for the trillions of dollars in tax cuts he's proposing. And he actually said he will raise more money with lower tax rates. Well, I think it probably will do even more than before. If you look at what's going to happen to the economy, the economy is going to just be absolutely like a rocket. It's going to go up. This is my prediction. This is what I'm good at. This is really my wheelhouse. And I think you're going to create tremendous numbers of jobs. You know, a part of this, and as you and I were discussing, I'm also going to bring a lot of jobs back into the country because so many other countries have taken our jobs. They've taken our base. They've taken our manufacturing. So we're going to couple that with this tax plan. But we're going to have a country that really is going to rock it again. And we haven't had that for a long time, Aaron. You know, one of the things I mentioned during the news conference was that phony number of 5.3 and 5.4 and 5.5 percent unemployment. It could be 25 or 30 percent because, you know, when you stop looking for a job, they consider you for statistical purposes right. employed. And you must sort of they don't count look you. At they don't count you as unemployed no, when we you have are. millions, tens of millions of people that couldn't find a job and they're now mm -hmm. considered essentially employed. 
So we're going to do something that's really great, and this is the thing I like the most. I'm going to put people to work. I'm going to make. I'm going to be great for business. I'll be great for business, mm -hmm. and we're going to have an economy that really is going to be hot. You will you pay more money? Will it be millions and millions, hundreds of millions? How much more will you pay? I will probably end up paying more money. But at the same time, I think the economy will do better, so I'll make it up that way. But I will probably end up paying more money. I believe in the end I might do better because I really believe the economy is going to go boom, beautiful. So, so there's a couple ways when you cut a lot of taxes you can make up for it, right? You can close loopholes to make money up that way, Correct. right? Correct, and You're we, do have, we are that. doing that. Right, and the cuts in and of themselves can generate growth. You right. obviously believe that's a part growth of it, too. Growth is important. But let's talk about these loopholes because, you know, I, I, I called up some uh, economists who like your sort of plan. And one of them said, I'm really confused by it. It's a bit of a mess because they want to know what loopholes you're going to close. You took the mortgage interest loophole off the table. It benefits almost all Americans. I was thinking but about they it. they say, how can you get there without closing? Well, them? you know what? to do that because I really would be very concerned if you do that, you're not going to, you're going to stop housing production. And housing has had a lot of problems, and you've reported on it better than anybody over the years, but you can't take a chance on that. I mean, people need the mortgage deduction, mortgage interest deduction. So where do you get the money if not well, that carried interest. But one of the ways you're going to get it is, in my opinion, you know, one of the ways you're really going to get mm -hmm. it is, look, you know, many of your friends, they're hedge fund guys, and you have the carried interest deduction. You have a lot of other deductions that, frankly, it's a joke. It's tremendous amounts of money, and it's money that they really don't need they want it because they're used to paying no taxes okay or very little taxes Fair. but it's not money they need but the other thing so importantly and this is something that everybody agrees on for 10 years for years the money that's outside of this country nobody knows how much they think it's 2.5 trillion dollars i think it's probably more than that but nobody knows that money Aaron's going to come back into the country and it's going to stay here and they're going to invest it here and frankly from now on when people make when these companies make money outside of the country mm -hmm. they can bring it back in at a reasonable tax the reason it stays there is the tax is so onerous as you know it's a massive tax they that you'd have to be crazy to bring it back in no, and by the way yes. i have a lot of money outside of the country and the last thing i'm doing is for me because it's not that kind mm -hmm. of money but I have money out there. You can't get it back into the country. You fill out forms. You do this. I think my people have been working on it for like a year and a half. When you make money outside of the country, you can't bring it back into this country. So, so on the carried interest loophole, you're going to close it. Now, look, I, I have, uh, to use an appropriate word, campaigned about that on my own show, right? It's a, it's a smart thing to do. A lot do. of people It's the have. right thing to do. It's a fair thing to do. But it doesn't bring in a lot of money. It doesn't pay for very much. But so it brings in this. Say, it brings in psychologically when you yes. have a hedge fund guy who's making $200 million a year and he's got mm -hmm. this huge loss against it, which isn't a real loss. He's got mm -hmm. this huge loss against his income and he's paying a very low rate of tax. It's not fair. And I think it says a lot. I think it tells people a lot, and it's got to end. And by the way, but I have, I have you're friends. Right about that, but how do you how do you get the money then to make up for the trillions of dollars in tax cuts? Because, because carried interest isn't going to do it. Right. I agree with that. We're bringing in tremendous amounts of money into the country, and we're going to create jobs. We're going to have an economy that's going to be robust. Right now, there's no incentive for companies. There's just no. Actually, yeah. you're going to have the opposite. In my opinion, if it stays the way it is, you're going to have people companies big companies mm -hmm. and you know the ones that are talking about leaving they're leaving the country they're going to other countries to get their money number one and probably that not maybe that isn't even number one it's because they have a better tax rate outside of the united yeah. states and you have major companies that want to leave our country and it used to be they leave for florida or texas they're leaving now, and they're getting out of the United States. They're going and they're to Ireland. Taking, they're going somewhere. Ireland is a prime suspect. I mean, yeah. Ireland is really doing a lot of business. So Apple will pay more taxes. Well, under Apple, Donald Trump's plan. Apple is going to pay some taxes. They're, but, the, know, they're Apple, the biggest. They're Apple the biggest has, company with money overseas. Right. Apple has tremendous money overseas, and they're going to bring it back. And you know there's going to be a 10% tax on that money, but at least that's reasonable. They're going to bring it back, and then they're going to invest the money mostly here, in my opinion. They're going to mostly here. Now, they can invest it elsewhere, but mostly here. How will it be different than when George W. Bush did it? At that time, estimates are 92% of the money that came home went to shareholders, stock buybacks, things like that. Didn't go to factories, well, new but, jobs. Why would it even, be different? First of all, we're going to create a great incentive for the money to be invested. But mm -hmm. even if it does go to shareholders, the shareholders then are going to spend the money. You're going to have people in this country, stock owners of the company, mm -hmm. they're going to get X dollars, they're going to go out and buy things, and that's yeah. going to be good. The big surprise, in my opinion, is going to be how much money it is. Because, as you know, estimates are from 2.1 to 2.5, and then some people say it could be much higher than that. Mm. 
And I got a nice surprise today. Carl Icahn endorsed me. You heard that. Right? I did. I now saw that's that. That's a good endorsement. He picked on you a few understand. months ago, and now he's come no, around. He doesn't pick on me too much. I mean, he's a friend of mine, and he knows I know what I'm doing. I mean, look, Carl is no nonsense. One thing about Carl, there's no games. Mm -hmm. If he didn't think I was good and really good, he wouldn't have done that. But when you get Carl's endorsement in this world that we're talking about, that's a great endorsement. Today, I also have Tom yeah. Brady's endorsement. That's a different kind of an endorsement. It's a different world. But it's called winners. I like winners, and Tom is certainly a winner. Exclusive sit down with Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. We talked about his slipping poll numbers, his controversial campaign style, and how he'd handle Russian strongman Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin today was at the UN, so is Barack Obama. They could not be more different when it comes to Syria. Barack Obama uh, saying he wants Bashar al-Assad removed from power. Putin says he thinks that's an enormous mistake not to cooperate with Vladimir Putin. Which man is right? Okay, so I've been saying this for a long time, and I've kept it low, and I really understand what's going on in Syria, because mm -hmm. you look at it, first of all, it's a total catastrophe, it's a total mess, and we're helping to make it a mess. Now, we have ISIS, and ISIS wants to go after Assad, but we're knocking the hell out of him, even though it's not a very full-blown thing. We're still dropping bombs all over the place, and, you know, look, they're not exactly loving life over in Syria, so we're stopping them, to a certain extent, from going after Assad. You have Russia that's now there. Russia's on the side of Assad, and Russia wants to get rid of ISIS as much as we do, if not more, because they don't want them coming into Russia. And I'm saying, why are we knocking ISIS, and yet at the same time, we're against Assad, let them fight, take over the remnants, but more importantly, let Russia fight ISIS if they want to fight them. Let them fight them in Syria. Now, we can fight them in Iraq, but if you think about Iraq, We've spent $2 trillion, thousands of lives lost, wounded warriors who we love and I love all over the place. What do we have in Iraq? And did you see... You said you'd put ground troops on the ground in Iraq. Well, we're going to have to do something with ISIS. I, I was totally against the war in Iraq, and I was from the beginning. 2003, yes. 2004, because you're going to destabilize the Middle East, I was right. Donald Trump joins us. Uh, Mr. Trump, thank you very much. If you were President of the United States today, I would imagine you'd be preparing for the big storm. Well, you'd be preparing for a lot of problems, I can tell you. It's, uh, we, have, we have bigger problems even than the storm, if you look at our country. We have some very big problems. Wait, you're right about that. You know, uh, Donald Trump, as we speak to you now, uh, we understand Hillary Clinton's having a, having a rough day today. Uh, her, her emails uh, were attempted to be hacked by Russians, and we know at least four, over the course of four hours on an August date in 2011. Uh, we, this is something that we've been going through this morning, and we have about three of them that we can show you. But before we go through the specifics on these emails, what about Hillary Clinton's situation here, that she was made vulnerable by these Russian hackers in the form of fake speeding tickets, strikes you? Well, look, the whole thing is terrible for our country. What she did as Secretary of State was ridiculous. And, and you know, she wanted total privacy for whatever reason. You just uh, you would have had much more privacy the other way. But what she did is totally illegal. You look at what happened to General Petraeus, and as somebody who's a real expert on the subject said to me, he was 5% of what she did. It was nothing by comparison. And they destroyed his life. I mean, you know, they basically gave him a two-year sentence. And what she did was totally illegal. And it's hard to believe that nothing further is... I mean, it's hard to believe that she's even talking about running for president. You wouldn't believe it's possible, frankly, with what she's done and even the criminality involved that she can be talking about running for president. Well, speaking of the criminality, if she... You know, the FBI is looking at, at it right now. If they decide not to indict her, what would that say? It would obviously be politics, right? Well, I think they probably won't indict her because... You don't? Uh, yeah, because the attorney general is a, from New York, who I believe is a friend of Hillary Clinton. I think they probably won't indict her. And it's very unfair to General Petraeus and other people who have been indicted for far less than what she's done. But it's pure politics, and it's Democrats. And what will be interesting, if a Republican gets in, hopefully it's going to be Trump, if a Republican gets in, what would be, you know, you have a six-year statute of limitations on this. Well, would be interested if the Republicans get in, what would happen to her? Would they go after her? Because then you would have somebody that would be, I'm sure, very fair, but they'd look at it fairly, and would that happen? She may very well...
have to win the presidency because she may have bigger problems if she doesn't. Never right. Here's that. an example of the emails that have emerged, and you know they're about 30 percent through. We're going to see uh, drip, drip, drip. Uh, this is uh, from to Cheryl Mills, her assistant, who made the decision that the state will not use the terms mother and father, and it says substitute parent in one or two. I'm not defending the decision, but I disagree with. Knew no, I knew nothing about it in front of this uh, in front of this Congress. I could live with letting people in non-traditional families choose another descriptor. So as long as we retain the resumption a mother and father, we need to address this or we will be facing huge uh, Fox generated media storm led by Palin et al. So she uh, she had no clue about what we actually were doing on Fox and Friends. But Not the equality candidate yeah. that she no. is today. No, she did. Right. Let's move on and let's talk about something else. Uh, we were talking about your comments 48 hours ago before the new news happened with Russia going ahead and bombing and giving us hours notice saying stay out of the area. We're, we're going to start bombing. They tell our emissary in Baghdad this information without consultation. And now we find out, Donald Trump, they're not even bombing ISIS. They're bombing enemies of Assad. Does that change your stance of letting Russia handle it? Well, you know, the biggest problem I have is that you look at what's gone on with Libya with Gaddafi and Iraq with Saddam Hussein and with all of these people that we've been fighting against. And the problem is far greater. I mean, Iraq is a totally, total disaster. But Iraq led to the Middle East. Then you look at mm -hmm. Libya, total disaster. We don't know who these rebels are. You know, we're supposed to be fighting with rebels. We have no idea. Some of the people, I spoke to one of the generals, they didn't even know who they are we're fighting for. Is it worse than Assad? What's going on? And I do say this. Russia destroyed itself. You know, when it was the Soviet Union, they spent so much money in Afghanistan. They got bogged down. You watch. I bet they get bogged down again. They're going to go in here. They're going to get bogged down again. I really think, Brian, I think I understand your view, and I fully understand both sides of the picture. But I think we have to be very cool. Let's just see what happens. Mm -hmm. Don't Mr. move too fast. We're fighting for rebels that we have no idea who they are. They're probably right. going to be, if, if based on everything else we've seen with Iraq and with Libya, they're probably going to be worse than what you Mr. have in Trump. right now. And but what you have in right yeah. now is very bad. It is but, very bad, sir. Let me just ask you this. I don't believe you when you say sit back and let Russia take the lead. You're not a person who wants anyone to take the lead. No, you want to be number but, one. Why rest Elizabeth, on their laurels you, when they are underhanded and undermining our methods right now and we find out they're not even bombing who they said they would but you don't want to jump in for people that we don't even know who they are we're fighting for people that we have no idea who these rebels are i've heard the rebels are worse than anybody else i mean if they do, could be do, ISIS, do we, agree we have ISIS no idea who they are. Donald Trump, do we agree that ISIS, oh, ISIS is ISIS is absolutely the enemy. So that's where our intention was. ISIS is absolutely the enemy, and we have to do something very strong against ISIS, and frankly, we should be bombing the hell out of them. And frankly, go beyond the lines. You have to go beyond the lines of Syria. You know, we're talking about Syria, but ISIS is in Iraq, very big league. ISIS is all over the place. We have to be bombing ISIS. But... I don't think we should act so fast. We could just slow it down a little bit. Let's see what happens. Remember this. We're fighting for people that we have no idea who they were. Some of them we didn't even know until recently. And by the way, they could be ISIS. We could be fighting for ISIS. So I think we have to be very cool. I'll be honest. We have to be. And that's not usually the way I am. I want to be, you know, I want to be, I want to be very proactive. But I think we have to watch it, see. I believe Russia has a big stake in getting rid of ISIS also because they don't want them going into Russia. Right. I've heard that for a long time. I just, if I knew who these people were, if, I, if we thought they were George Washington, if we thought they were great, I'm all for you. But yeah. we have to find out. We have no idea who we're fighting for. All right. And it could be worse than Assad. As well, bad as he is, he's bad. But it could be worse than Assad. Yeah, I mean, look at uh, Qaddafi and Mubarak and Hussein. We had regime change in all those places. And, and look it, what happened. Right. Yeah, exactly. We took the lid off the garbage can. Should have left the lid on it. Meanwhile, let's take a look at uh, the brand new USA Today Suffolk uh, University poll. And congratulations, you are, uh, once again, leading the pack at 23%. You're 10 above Ben Carson and Carly Fiorina. Uh, Marco Rubio has 9%, and it looks like you're about three times what Jeb Bush has right now. Well, I'm honored. I mean, I just see these polls coming out. We've had polls where I'm at 36 and 37. I guess they're online, so people don't like to report them, but I think they're really accurate polls. Right. And last night in New Hampshire, we had uh, 3,500 
and 56 yeah. people. Well, it was you. unbelievable, was and the, the enthusiasm yeah. and everything else. So there's something happening out there that's really beautiful to watch. And we got a glimpse of Melania in her first interview. Will we be seeing more? I'm Mrs. Trump. And People Magazine, right? Well, you will, and I'm sure she'll be on your show at the right time. She's going to be there. She would love to be. Well, Fantastic. I'll give her a spot. Melania and I have talked before. Yeah. We cannot. Absolutely. She's got a great a perspective on being an immigrant to this That's country. Right. Yeah. All right, uh, Donald Trump, thank you very much for joining us. Go run your empire and your presidential campaign. I will. Thank you very much. Quarters in New York City. So you're back. How does it feel? I'm back. How does it feel? Well, it feels good. You've always been fair to me, Bill. I've never had a problem with you. You've always treated me with respect and fairly, and uh, I've always appreciated that. Right. You know that. Well, that's going to change tonight. Uh, okay. We're going to do two segments with Why not? you. Going to do two segments. Okay. First segment is policy. Second will be the fairness doctrine as it pertains to you, or people being fair to you. All right, policy question number one. What specific tax deductions will you banish as president in your tax plan? Well, one thing we're doing is we're getting rid of the carried interest, which, you know, gives uh, hedge fund guys on Wall Street a tremendous advantage. They're making hundreds of millions of dollars and they're paying very little tax. And I think it's very unfair. And it affects me, too. It, frankly, is a big benefit for me, but I'm willing to do that. It's unfair. It's very substantial. And we're going to get rid of it. We're going to, we just came out, as you know, yesterday with a tax plan where it's a big simplification and really great for middle-income families. Right, it's going to be that. a phenomenal bill. We, all, we know all that. All right, so this earned interest thing you're going to get away with. How about deductions for private jets? Do they get, are they knocked out? Well, if they're used in business, it's a business tool. All so right, that's so you're not, not going to knock out that. How about, certain how about season tickets at the Yankees? If it's used for business, we're not knocking that out because that really is something having to do with business. You okay. take people to games, you take people to whatever you're doing. But that's a positive thing. That's a positive but I'm thing for to the get... economy. We don't want to, Bill, we don't want to hurt. What we don't want to do is we don't want to hurt business. We want to inspire business. We I got want to that. inspire people to create jobs. But I'm trying to get the $20 trillion debt around my neck. I understand well, you're doing what Ronald doing... Reagan did. You're doing what Ronald Reagan did. I just wrote a book on Reagan. I know Reagan inside and out. You're doing exactly what he did. You want to stimulate the free marketplace by putting more money back into it, more research and development, more job creation. That's what you're trying to do. And I actually agree that that has to be done now after seven years of Barack Obama failing to stimulate the economy. However, your plan was going to bring down government revenue. All right, they're going to get less money. So you say, but, but in the long run, they'll get more because more people will be in the workplace, more people will be paying taxes, and it'll go up. Fine, but speculative. Right. Fine, but speculative. So the only thing I'm hearing that you're going to knock out is these head fund guys carrying money from one year to the next. And I don't know if that's going to be enough to stop the debt from rising another $5 trillion. No, the big thing we're doing, Bill, is when I get in, and I will tell you this, and I said this very clearly, I'm a cost cutter. I know how to cut costs. We have tremendous waste and abuse in this country. If you look at some of the things that are happening in the country in terms of right, costs, well, give me the one way big, they spend money, one big like thing a you're bunch of cut. drunken... One big thing you're going to uh, cut right I am away. I'm going to cut big, big Department of Education, as an example. I'm a believer. I mean, you, you have somebody like a Jeb Bush and Rubio and others. They're big into big education and big, and I'm f all for education. I want to be local. Department of Education, tremendous cuts. Department of Environmental Protection, where they're actually going around and causing damage as opposed to saving damage. A tremendous amounts of money. Okay, so you're going to go with a cleaver fraud, through. Tremendous abuse. All right. Now. Oh, we're talking about tremendous amounts of money, Bill. We're talking about tremendous amounts okay. of money. Okay, and I believe and you if you were like the president. Taxes, I believe you if you were, you would you take a cleaver to those things. I believe it. Let's go to Putin. I would uh, do Putin. very well. People would be very happy. Did Putin go up and say, you know, you say you and Putin are going to be close. Did, did Putin go up to your office and did you guys like bond or anything this week? He's in town. No, I didn't know anything about him coming to my office, but I will tell you that I think in terms of leadership, he's getting an A and our president is not doing so okay. well. They did not look good together. What do you think Putin is up to in the Middle East? He's moving planes, he's moving uh, advisors into Syria. What is he up to? Well, we spent two trillion dollars, thousands of lives, wounded warriors all over, and Putin is now taking over what we started. 
and he's going into Syria, and he frankly wants to fight ISIS, and I think that's a wonderful thing. You know, I said that a year ago, and everybody said, oh, that's terrible. If he wants to fight ISIS, let him fight ISIS. Why do we always have to do everything? But he wants to go in. He wants to fight ISIS. Now, he wants to keep, as you know, he wants to keep your leadership, your current leadership, Assad, in Syria. Personally, I've been looking at the different players, and I've been watching Assad, and I've been pretty good at this stuff over the years, because deals are people. And I'm looking at Assad and saying, maybe he's better than the kind of people that we're supposed to be backing, because we don't even know yeah, who Yeah, but he's a, he's a mass we murderer no and with the, the gas and all of that. But what's the downside of Putin fighting We don't ISIS? know. What's the downside well, of Putin there's, fighting I ISIS? Say there's, I say there's very little downside with Putin fighting ISIS, and Putin wants to keep ISIS out of Russia, and therefore he's become very right. active with I'm going to tell you what the downside and think, is. And I, I think that's to our benefit. I'm going to tell you what the downside well, is. Well, you're going to say the downside is we're losing control of the Middle East. No, no. But with once, this kind of leadership, Putin we're not going to have control of anything. Once Putin gets in and fights ISIS on behalf of Assad, Putin runs Syria. He owns it. He'll never get out. Never. All right. Okay. Fine. I mean, you know, we can be in Syria. Do you want to run Syria? Do you want to own Syria? No, I want to rebuild but I think our Putin, country, Bill. Putin I want wants to, to run and call the shots in the Middle East, and the United States yeah, will be on the sure. side. I said that. Sure. That's what That's he wants. Right. And you have huge oil reserves. You have huge. You have tremendous wealth in the Middle East that people don't even know about. And by the way, forget about Putin. You have Iran is going to take over Iraq. I called that many years ago on your show. I said we should have never gone into Iraq, which I should be given a little credit for vision because I'm the only one running that said that. But we should have never because you All totally right. destabilized the Middle East. And that's true. But that's the what fact happened. is that Putin now, well, that's what happened. You destabilized. Yeah. And by the way, Iran is going to be taking over Iraq, including their vast oil reserves, and the leftovers are taken over by ISIS. So what have we done with our incompetent leadership? We have given the Middle East primarily to Putin and Iran, and they will run it for the foreseeable future. And if you were elected president, I believe you'd have to true. deal with that, and that's going to be one hard thing to deal with. Now, as I said, we're going to hold you over, and we appreciate you coming on. We're going to talk about fairness now from New York City, Donald Trump. What do you what do you say to that? If, you, if somebody shoots up a mosque, you're responsible. Well, I think it's terrible what's going on. I can tell you, in New York City, they used to go in and check and do a lot of different things, and now they're not doing any checking. And I think, frankly, the question that was asked of me in New Hampshire, which was a packed house and a lot of enthusiasm. I just didn't want to respond to the question. It's the first time I've ever been sort of made controversial by not responding to a question. But <laughs> they wanted me to defend President Obama, and he can defend himself. I okay. don't have to defend Obama. Okay. But, I mean, look, the media is not going to give you a fair shake, and then it's not. But that brings us to That's me, true. me and you. All right? You're on record as saying yeah. that I've been fair to you, and I believe I have. So let me ask you a couple of questions. And if they're unfair, you tell me if they're unfair. All right. Am I fair to say that in order for you to win the Republican nomination, that you're going to have to change your style and be a bit kinder and more mature? Is that a fair question? Well, I think it's fair. I think the word mature is not appropriate, but I think it's certainly fair. I think that, you know, as you know, I'm leading every poll and most polls I'm leading very big in New Hampshire, in uh, Iowa. If you look at what just came down, South Carolina, the polls all number one. So I can't be doing so badly, Bill, but it's not going to be a question of nice. I think I'm a nice person. I have great relationships. You know me well. I help people. I love people. But it's not going to be a question of that. It's going to be a question of competence because people are tired of being pushed around by every country in the world. Every and that's single why thing. you're we doing well. But you have, to, you have to be kind of presidential. I'm going to run a clip now of something you recently said, and then I'm going to ask you another question, which may be unfair. If it is, you tell me. Roll. Now, would I be unfair to say to you, which I would if we were at a Yankee game, hey, calling Senator Rubio a clown was not presidential. No, I don't think it'd be unfair, but I have to tell you how that all started. I was getting along with him perfectly fine two weeks ago. Everything was fine. I don't really know him. And all of a sudden, he attacks me about nothing, but really attacked me quite viciously. And I fought back. I told people that he has one of the worst voting records. He has the worst voting record in the Senate. He never shows up. Then he never shows up. I mean, he's not going in for votes, and that you can't do. He's weak on immigration, unbelievably weak on immigration. And I'm all about strong on illegal immigration and other things. So I mentioned it, and I said it loudly. But 
again, I'm a counterpuncher. He hit me all of a sudden. Okay, Same thing and with and Rand I didn't Paul. Mind Rand the gang Paul was so stuff. nice. I didn't mind the Gang of A stuff. Well, He's calling him a clown. He was, he was a That's member of the Gang of A. That's not presidential. All right, final question. Okay, listen. Excuse right. me, Bill. He was a member of the Gang of Eight, which was a disaster. He was totally weak on immigration. But and that's by the fine, way, he hasn't changed. But it's the clown stuff that's not fine. Last question. Well, okay. I, you, I can understand okay, that. Okay, good. You have the but highest. But he hit me very viciously. But on policy, he, you have the highest unfavorables in the polls. All right? More people don't like you than any other candidate. Is it fair to ask you why you think that is? Well, I also have the highest positives in the poll. Yeah, That's I know. why You're I'm like leading Howard every Cosell. poll. Remember so Howard? It's, it's a combination. Yeah, you mean like Howard yeah, Cosell. I guess, you know, I think you can see this. I've done very well over the last number of months in terms of getting the unfavorables much better. If you look at New Hampshire, I'm doing great with respect to favorable, unfavorable, very positive. Uh, Iowa, the places that I'm going to a lot, South Carolina, I'm doing great in that category. So I think when people see me, when they see I want to make America great again, they all of a sudden say, you know, we really like them. I'm actually so a nice person. Grow I try on very everybody. hard to be a nice person. You're going to grow on us then. You're going to grow on. Well, when I go to Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, they really like me, and my All favorables right. are great there because they see me a lot. I got it. The more you see you, the more you're going to like you. Now, fair interview? Well, for Was whatever it, reason. Fair? Everything fair? Are we good? You were very fair. You're always fair. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Almost. And we're, almost, I know. Okay, and we appreciate you coming. And in fact, not only are we the A-team, we even have our own Mr. T, who doesn't mind saying about others, you're a fool. The best way for us to give this election back would be to nominate a Donald Trump. He'll either implode in a general election, or if God forbid, if he were in the White House, we have no idea what he would do. You can't just attack him on policy. He doesn't care about policy. It's not enough to say he was for socialized medicine or higher Thank taxes. You, Governor. He's not serious. You got Hillary Clinton to go to your wedding That's because true. you gave her That's money. True. Maybe it works for Hillary Clinton. I was, excuse it doesn't me, work Jeff, for anybody on, Jeff, this, on this stage. I was a this, businessman. I got along with Clinton. I got along with everybody. Yeah. That was my job, to get along with people. But the I simple didn't wanna, fact excuse is... Excuse me. One second. No. I the didn't want to... fact is, Jeff, Donald, you good. cannot take... More energy tonight. I like no. that. First of all, Rand Paul shouldn't even be on this stage. He's number 11. He's got 1% in the polls. And how he got up here, there's far too many people. Anyway. I think that really goes to really the judgment. Do we want some with that kind of character, that kind of careless language? to be negotiating with Putin. Do we want someone like that to be negotiating with Iran? His, his visceral response to attack people on their appearance, short, tall, fat, ugly. My goodness, that happened in junior high. Are we not way above that? Would we not all be worried to have someone like that in charge of the nuclear Jake, arsenal? Jake the Mr. Trump. I never attacked him on his look, and believe me, there's plenty of subject matter right there. And Donald Trump said the following about you, quote, Look at that face. Would anyone vote for that? Can you imagine that, the face of our next president? Mr. Trump later said he was talking about your persona, not your appearance. I think women all over this country heard very clearly what Mr. Trump said. I think she's got a beautiful face, and I think she's a beautiful woman. But let me say this flat out. Donald Trump is unfit to be president of the United States or the Republican Party's nominee. And, and Mr. Trump, we don't need an apprentice in the White House. We don't need an apprentice in the White House. We have one right now. He told us all the things we wanted to hear back in 2008. We don't know who you are or where you're going. We need someone who can actually get the job done. And you talked about business. Well, in Wisconsin, you, you excuse no, me. No, 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 let me talk about in this. In Wisconsin, you're losing $2.2 billion dollars right one now. One of the reasons I would talk so the front runner, Republican voters that. say, is because they like the fact that he is not, not bought and paid for by wealthy donors. Mr. Trump has repeatedly said that the $100 million you've raised for your campaign makes you a puppet for your donors. Are you? No, absolutely not. People are supporting me because I have a proven record of conservative leadership, where I cut taxes $19 billion over eight years. We shrunk the state government workforce. We created a climate that led the nation in job growth seven out of eight years. We were one of two states to go to AAA bond rating. 
People know that we need principle-centered leadership, a disruptor to go to Washington, D.C. The one guy that had some special interests that I know of that tried to get me to change my views on something that was generous and gave me money was Donald Trump. He wanted casino gambling in Florida. I did. Yes, you did. Totally false. You wanted it, and you, you didn't get to, it, I because I was it. opposed to casino gambling I, I before, promise I during, it. and after. And that's not, I'm not going to be bought by I anybody. I promise, if I wanted it, I would have gotten it. No way, man. <laughs> Believe me. Nope. I know my people. Not even possible. I know my people. Is there anything else you want to say about no, this? No, I just uh, will tell you that, you know, Jeb made the statement. I'm not only referring to him. I, a lot of money was raised by a lot of different people that are standing up here. And the donors, the special interests, the lobbyists have very strong power over these people. I'm spending all of my money. I'm not spending, I'm not getting any. I turned down, I, I turned down so much. I could have right now from special interests and donors, I could have double and triple what he's got. I've turned it down. I've turned down last week $5 million from somebody. So I will tell you, I understand the game. I've been on the other side all of my life, and they have a lot of control over our politicians. And I don't say that favorably, and I'm not sure if there's another system, but I say this, I am not accepting any money from anybody. Nobody has control of me other than the people of this country. Kevin I'm going to do the right thing. You, you got, according to, your, uh, to what you said on one of the talk shows, you got Hillary Clinton to go to your wedding That's because true. you gave her That's money. True. Maybe it works for Hillary Clinton. I was, it doesn't me, work Jeff. for anybody on, this, on this stage. I was a this, businessman. I got along with Clinton. I got along with everybody. Yeah. That was my job, to get along with people. But the I simple didn't wanna, fact is... Excuse me. One second. No. I didn't want to... The simple fact is, get, Donald, oh, you good. cannot take... More energy tonight. I like no. that. Look. I was asked the question. I didn't want... It was my obligation as a businessman, to my family, to my company, to my employees, to get along with all politicians. I got along with all of them, and I did a damn good job in doing it. Go ahead. So, he supports Pelosi, he supports Schumer, he supports Clinton. Got along when with he, everybody. And he, when, he asked, when he asked Florida to have studies, casino gambling, have we said no. Wrong. And we said there's no, any and that's the simple between fact. Vaccinations the simple and fact. autism. Yeah. Uh, this was something that was uh, spread widely 15 or 20 years ago. And it has not been adequately, uh, you know, revealed to the public what's actually going on. Vaccines are very important, certain ones, the ones that would prevent death or crippling. There are others, there are a multitude of vaccines which probably don't fit in that category, and there should be some discretion in those cases. But, you know, a lot of this is, is, is pushed by big government, and I think that's one of the things that people so vehemently. Uh, want to get rid of big government. You know, we have 4.1 million federal employees, 650 federal agencies and department. That's why they have to take so much of our taxes. Should he stop saying it? Should he stop saying the vaccines cause autism? Well, you know, I've just explained it to him. Uh, he can read about it if he wants to. I think he's an intelligent man and will make the correct decision after getting the real facts. Mr. Trump, as president, well, I'd, you would... I'd like to, I'd like I'm to going respond. right to you. I'd like Mr. to Mr. Trump, as president, you would be in charge of the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health, both of which say you are wrong. How would you handle this as president? Autism has become an epidemic. 25 years ago, 35 years ago, you look at the statistics, not even close. It has gotten totally out of control. I am totally in favor of vaccines, but I want smaller doses over a longer period of time. Because you take a baby in, and I've seen it, and I've seen it, and I had my children taken care of over a long period of time, over a two or three year period of time, same exact amount. But you take this little beautiful baby and you pump, I mean, it looks just like it's meant for a horse, not for a child. And we've had so many instances, people that worked for me just the other day, Two years old, two and a half years old, a child, a beautiful child, went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. I only say it's not, I'm in favor of vaccines. Do them over a longer period of time, same amount. Thank but you. Just in, in little sections. Dr. Car I Dr. Think, and I think you're going to have, I think you're going to see a big impact on autism. Dr. Carson, you just heard his medical take. <laughs> He's an okay doctor. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, 
We have extremely well-documented proof that there's no autism associated with vaccinations. But it is true that we are probably giving way too many in too short a period of time. And a lot of pediatricians now recognize that and I think are cutting down on the number and the proximity in which those are done. And, and that's, I think all, that's, I'm saying, that's all I'm saying, Jake. That's all I'm saying. Dr. Paul, I'd like to bring you in. That is rocking his wife's presidential campaign. Former president sitting down with our Fred Zakaria to explain why he thinks the private server Hillary used as Secretary of State has become such a big deal. There will be a new president in uh, 2017, uh, January. You're, some would say, the most uh, skilled student of American politics. Uh, why do you think Hillary Clinton is having a tougher time than many imagined? Uh, the, the lead in the national polls has narrowed. Iowa and New Hampshire seem tough. For well, I think you know why. I think you know why. In, in 1992, I received a call. Before, in 91, before I started running for president, from the Bush White House, from a man I did, he said, we've looked at the field, you're the only one who can win. The press has to have someone every election. We're going to give them you. You better not run. So all of a sudden, something nobody thought was an issue, Whitewater, that turned out never to be an issue, winds up being a $70 million investigation. And all the hammering happened. And you ask voters, do you really believe this? This amounts to anything? No. But do you trust him as much? No. There must be something. So this is just something that has been a regular feature of all of our presidential campaigns except in 2008 for unique reasons. So ever since Watergate, something like this happens. I'd rather it happen now than later. And it was always going to happen. The, the other party doesn't want to run against her. And if they do, they'd like her as mangled up as possible. And they know that if they leak things and say things, that that is catnip to the people who get bored talking about what's your position on student loan relief or dealing with the shortage of mental health care. We're seeing history repeat itself. And I actually am amazed that she's borne up under it as well as she has. But I have never seen so much expended on so little. There have been a shocking number of really reputable press people who have explained how you can't receive or transmit classified information, how the government has no central authority for classification, that defense, state, and the intelligence agencies have their own. I mean, there have been a lot of really fine things. It's just that they don't seem to show up on television very much. And it is what it is. But I think she, you know, she went out and did her interviews, said she was sorry that using her personal email caused all this confusion. And she'd like to give the election back to the American people. And I trust the people. I think it'll be all right. But it's obvious what happened. You know, at the beginning of the year, she was the most admired person in public life, and she earned it. Why? Because she was being covered by people who reported on what she was doing. The New START Treaty, the Iran sanctions, tripling the number of people on AIDS getting medicine for no more tax money. America was, when, when she left office, our approval rating was more than 20 points higher than it had previously been. What happened? The presidential campaign happened. And the uh, nature of the coverage shifted from issue-based to political. And it happened. You can't complain. This is not, this is a contact sport. They're not giving the job away. And people who want to race wanted her to drop some. And the people in the other party desperately wanted it because she's already put out more positions on more issues and said how she would pay for them, I think, than all the others combined based on the two, the Republicans, based on the two debates I saw. But you think it's a Republican plot, really? No, I'm not going there because that's what the, it's not a, a plot makes it sound like it's a secret. It, no, I think that that uh, 
there are lots of people who wanted there to be a race for different reasons. And they thought the only way they could make it a race was a full-scale frontal assault on her. And so this email thing became the biggest story in the world. Very interesting to hear his perspective. You can see Free's entire sit-down interview with Bill Clinton. We may be seeing the start of that. The former president sat down with CNN's Fareed Zakaria, weighing in on the phenomenon that is Donald Trump. I, I, I got to ask you about Donald Trump. And as a great student of American politics, what explains Donald Trump? Well, first of all, he's a master brander. And when you've got a lot of people running, and people are trying to make distinctions, being able to put a personal stamp on it so people identify with who you are counts for something, certainly in the beginning. Then he said to the working class supporters of the Republican Party that have largely shifted over for cultural reasons. I'll give you economic reason to vote for me. I'll build a wall around the southern border of America and I'll stop buying Chinese imports. So your incomes will go up. Now, that'll all have to be fleshed out in the course of time, and I'm sure the other the future debates will do it. But he's got a lot of pizzazz and zip. He's branded himself in a clear way, and he's generated some excitement. And it remains to be seen what's going to happen. It's, it's an unusual election. You know, there's... Um, there doesn't seem to be much um, interest yet on their side. I think there is on our side because both Hillary and Senator Sanders have laid out pretty detailed, positive policy positions, talked about what they would cost. And, you know, you can actually have a debate there where you could discuss the relative merits of their positions on health care or generating jobs or lifting incomes or whatever. But... Over there, it seems to be more about resentments and one-liners. I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Could, could Trump be the nominee? I think so. Wow. I mean, how do I know? I don't understand. I don't understand any of it very well. I'm, look, I've been out of politics a long time. I haven't run for office in 20 years. And, and also, I'm not mad at anybody. I mean, you know, I'm... I'm a grandfather. I love my foundation. I'm proud of Hillary. I'll do what I can to help her. But uh, I'm not the best pundit anymore. I don't have a good feel for this. All I know is what I think is good for the country. And I think the country needs somebody who can give us broadly shared prosperity, help families and kids, try to reduce the impact of all this huge anonymous money in our political system, and in a world full of challenges, keep big bad things from happening and make as many good things happen as possible. That's how I would define the job of the next president. That's what I think. And uh, so I think Hillary would be a great president. You will get more of Reed's interview with Bill Clinton. It'll come up in our 7 o'clock hour uh, of New Day here. The former president... His GOP rivals, Vladimir Putin, ISIS, and even Bill Clinton. The economy is going to just be absolutely like a rocket. It's going to go up. Let's go out front. Good evening, everyone. I'm Aaron Burnett. Out front tonight, my exclusive sit-down with Donald Trump. He is still on top of the polls, and today he rolled out a tax plan promising massive tax cuts for millions of Americans. He tells me it will make the U.S. economy go up like a rocket. Wow. Here's the bottom That's line. The plan would cut income taxes for everyone, with the richest Americans going from paying 40 to only 25 percent of their income, and apparently 31 million American households will go from paying something to nothing at all. Earlier, I sat down with Mr. Trump at Trump Tower. We talked about the tax plan. We also talked about the polls and the war of words. He's engaged with, uh, in, in with nearly every single one of his rivals. People sit at the temper in question. They say, look, this is a guy who'll call someone a loser. He'll say something and 
They say that well, that's childish, but they say that that's childish. They say that's not the temperament of a president. Probably is a little childish, but you know what? This is a campaign. So I, you're I, saying I, you're not going to talk about a Vladimir Putin no, calling him a loser that. or I'll, something like that? I, I actually president? say the opposite. Tonight, our entire interview, we begin, though, by talking money. I asked Trump how he will pay for the trillions of dollars in tax cuts he's proposing. And he actually said he will raise more money with lower tax rates. Well, I think it probably will do even more than before. If you look at what's going to happen to the economy, the economy is going to just be absolutely like a rocket. It's going to go up. This is my prediction. This is what I'm good at. This is really my wheelhouse. And I think you're going to create tremendous numbers of jobs. You know, a part of this, and as you and I were discussing, I'm also going to bring a lot of jobs back into the country because so many other countries have taken our jobs. They've taken our base. They've taken our manufacturing. So we're going to couple that with this tax plan. But we're going to have a country that really is going to rocket again. And we haven't had that for a long time, Aaron. You know, one of the things I mentioned during the news conference was that phony number of 5.3 and 5.4 and 5.5 percent unemployment. It could be 25 or 30 percent because, you know, when you stop looking for a job, they consider you for statistical purposes right. employed. And you must sort of they don't count. Look you, at that. They don't count you as unemployed. No, when we you have are. millions, tens of millions of people that couldn't find a job and they're now mm -hmm. considered essentially employed. So we're going to do something that's really great. And this is the thing I like the most. I'm going to put people to work. I'm going to make, I'm going to be great for business. I'll be great for business. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have an economy that really is going to be hot. You, will you pay more money? Will it be millions and millions, hundreds of millions? How much more will you pay? I will probably end up paying more money. But at the same time, I think the economy will do better. So I'll make it up that way. But I will probably end up paying more money. I believe in the end I might do better because I really believe the economy is going to go boom, growth. beautiful. So, so there's a couple ways when you cut a lot of taxes you can make up for it, right? You can close loopholes to make money up that way, Correct. right? And You're going to do a little We bit are of doing that. that, right? And the cuts in and of themselves can generate growth. You right. obviously believe that's a part growth of it is too. Important. But let's talk about these loopholes because you know I, I called up some uh, economists who like your sort of plan. And one of them said, I'm really confused by it. It's a bit of a mess because they want to know what loopholes you're going to close. You took the mortgage interest loophole off the table. It benefits almost all Americans. I was thinking but about they it. they say, how can you get there without closing? Well, you know what? You have to do that because I really would be very concerned if you do that, you're not going to, you're going to stop housing production. And housing has had a lot of problems, and you've reported on it better than anybody over the years. But you can't take a chance on that. I mean, people need the mortgage deduction, mortgage interest deduction. So where do you get the money if not well, that carried way? interest. But one of the ways you're going to get it is, in my opinion, you know, one of the ways you're really going to get it mm -hmm. is, look, you know, many of your friends, they're hedge fund guys, and you have the carried interest deduction. You have a lot of other deductions that, frankly, it's a joke. It's tremendous amounts of money, and it's money that they really don't need they want it because they're used to paying no taxes okay or very little taxes Fair. but it's not money they need but the other thing so importantly and this is something that everybody agrees on for 10 years for years the money that's outside of this country nobody knows how much they think it's 2.5 trillion dollars i think it's probably more than that but nobody knows that money Aaron's going to come back into the country and it's going to stay here and they're going to invest it here and frankly from now on when people make when these companies make money outside of the country mm -hmm. they can bring it back in at a reasonable tax the reason it stays there is the tax is so onerous as you know it's a massive tax they that you'd have to be crazy back. to bring it back in no. and by the way yes. I have a lot of money outside of the country and the last thing I'm doing is for me because it's not that kind mm -hmm. of money but I have money outside. You can't get it back into the country. You fill out forms. You do this. I think my people have been working on it for like a year and a half. When you make money outside of the country, you can't bring it back into this country. So, so on the carried interest loophole, you're going to close it. Now, look, I, I have, to use an appropriate word, campaigned about that on my own show, right? It's a, it's a smart thing to a lot do. Of people it's the have. right thing to do. It's a fair thing to do. But it doesn't bring in a lot of money. It doesn't pay for very much. But so it brings in this. Say, it brings in psychologically when you yes. have a hedge fund guy who's making two hundred million dollars a year and he's got mm -hmm. this huge loss against it which isn't a real loss he's got mm -hmm. this huge loss against his income and he's paying a very low rate of tax it's not fair and I think it says a lot I think it tells people a lot and it's got to end and by the way but I have, look, I have friends right about that, but how do you how do you get the money then to make up for the trillions of dollars in tax cuts because carried interest isn't going to do it right I agree with that we're bringing in tremendous amounts of money into the country and we're going to create jobs we're going to have an economy that's going to be robust right now there's no incentive for companies there's just no actually you're going to have the opposite in my opinion if it stays the way it is you're going to have people 
companies, big companies, mm -hmm. and you know the ones that are talking about leaving, they're leaving the country, they're going to other countries to get their money, number one, and probably, that not, maybe that isn't even number one, it's because they have a better tax rate outside of the United yeah. States. And you have major companies that want to leave our country, and it used to be they leave for Florida or Texas, they're leaving now, and they're getting out of the United States. They're going and to they're Ireland, taking, they're going somewhere. Else. Ireland is a prime suspect. I mean, yeah. Ireland is really doing a lot of business. So Apple will pay more taxes. Well, under Apple, Donald Trump's plan. Apple is going to pay some taxes. They're, but, the, know, they're Apple, the biggest, they're Apple the biggest has, company with money overseas. Right. Apple has tremendous money overseas, and they're going to bring it back. And you know there's going to be a 10% tax on that money, but at least that's reasonable. They're going to bring it back, and then they're going to invest the money mostly here, in my opinion. They're going to mm -hmm. mostly here. Now, they can invest it elsewhere, but mostly here. How will it be different than when George W. Bush did it? At that time, estimates are 92% of the money that came home went to shareholders, stock buybacks, things like that. Didn't go to factories, well, new jobs. But, Why but would it even, be different? First of all, we're going to create a great incentive for the money to be invested. But mm -hmm. even if it does go to shareholders, the shareholders then are going to spend the money. You're going to have people in this country, stock owners of the company, mm -hmm. they're going to get X dollars, they're going to go out and buy things, and that's mm -hmm. going to be good. The big surprise, in my opinion, is going to be how much money it is. Because as you know, estimates are from 2.1 to 2.5, and then some people say it could be much higher than that. Mm -hmm. And I got a nice surprise today. Carl Icahn endorsed me. You heard that. Right? I did. I now saw that's that. A good in he picked on you a few understand. months ago, and now he's come no, around. He doesn't pick on me too much. I mean, he's a friend of mine, and he knows I know what I'm doing. I mean, look, Carl is no nonsense. One thing about Carl, there's no games. Mm -hmm. If he didn't think I was good and really good, he wouldn't have done that. But when you get Carl's endorsement in this world that we're talking about, that's a great endorsement. Today, I also have Tom Brady's endorsement. That's a different kind of an endorsement. It's a different world. But it's called winners. I like winners. And Tom is certainly a winner. Exclusive sit down with Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. We talked about his slipping poll numbers, his controversial campaign style, and how he'd handle Russian strongman Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin today was at the UN, so is Barack Obama. They could not be more different when it comes to Syria. Barack Obama uh, saying he wants Bashar al-Assad removed from power. Putin says he thinks that's an enormous mistake not to cooperate with Vladimir Putin. Which man is right? Okay, so I've been saying this for a long time, and I've kept it low, and I really understand what's going on in Syria, because mm -hmm. you look at it, first of all, it's a total catastrophe, it's a total mess. And we're helping to make it a mess. Now, we have ISIS, and ISIS wants to go after Assad. But we're knocking the hell out of him, even though it's not a very full-blown thing. We're still dropping bombs all over the place. And, you know, look, they're not exactly loving life over in Syria. So we're stopping them, to a certain extent, from going after Assad. You have Russia that's now there. Russia's on the side of Assad. And Russia wants to get rid of ISIS as much as we do, if not more, because they don't want him coming into Russia. And I'm saying... Why are we knocking ISIS, and yet at the same time, we're against Assad, let them fight, take over the remnants, but more importantly, let Russia fight ISIS if they want to fight them. Let them fight them in Syria. Now, we can fight them in Iraq, but if you think about Iraq, we've spent two trillion dollars, thousands of lives lost, wounded warriors who we love and I love all over the place. What do we have in Iraq? And did you see... You said you'd put ground troops on the ground in Iraq. Well, we're going to have to do something with ISIS. I, I was totally against the war in Iraq, and I was from the beginning. 2003, yes. 2004, because you're going to destabilize the Middle East, I was right. And should be given credit, because out of everybody running, I'm the one person that said, don't do it. And in How fact, do you put Bush, ground troops in Iraq, though, but not in Syria? I mean, well, there, because there is I'm no saying, border, essentially, look, between those countries. Let Syria and ISIS fight. Why, are we, why do we care? Let ISIS and Syria fight. And let Russia, they're in Syria already, mm -hmm. let them fight ISIS. I look, I don't want ISIS. I don't want ISIS. ISIS is bad. They're evil. When they start doing with the head chopping and drowning of everything, these are really bad dudes. So I don't want them. But let them fight it out. Let Russia take care of ISIS. How many, pe how many places can we be? So essentially you're uh, saying let Russia take care of ISIS. If, if Vladimir Putin wants Bashar al-Assad to stay because it makes sense for him, you're okay with so that. So I've watched him a lot, and I've made a lot of money watching people. You know, deals are people, okay? People say, what is, what is a deal? How do you make good deals? It's all about analyzing people. So I've watched Assad, and I've watched a little bit on the other side. The problem is the other side of Assad, we have no idea who they are. Hmm. So they probably are ISIS. I'm saying... Are we better off with Assad? We have no idea who these people are. We give them weapons, we give them ammunition, we give them everything. Mm -hmm. Aaron, we have no idea who, I mean, maybe it's worse than Assad. 
So what are we doing? Why are we involved? Hmm. We have to get rid of ISIS, very importantly. But I look at Assad, and Assad, to me, looks better than the other side. And, you know, this has happened before. We back a certain side. That side turns out to be a total catastrophe. Russia likes Assad seemingly a lot. Let them worry about ISIS. Let them mm -hmm. fight it out. Mm -hmm. Now, in Iraq, we have to do it. We shouldn't have been there in the first place, but we left the wrong way. When Obama took us out the way he took us out, that was a mistake. We should never have been there in the first place. So uh, when we talk about the Middle East, you know, you've been critical of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, but unlike some, you haven't said you'd throw it out. You said you'd make it a better deal. Well, that's I'm, what a, you would... I'm a person that's a business person. So you, you just would, can't you would do improve that. the deal. But, but Aaron, with that being yeah. said, and you've known some of the deals, I've, I've bought into really bad contracts knowingly. And I've bought them cheap because they're bad contracts. And I've taken those bad contracts and make them, I've mm -hmm. made them great. I've made a fortune. What you have to do is this. I will analyze that contract so strongly. I will go after it. And believe me, if mm -hmm. they violate that contract, they have problems. But what they've done is they have totally out-negotiated us. The fact that they get $150 billion, the fact that we have the 24-day wait period, and it's actually okay, much more than that. Before we can inspect, yes. Oh, no, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, 24 days before we can inspect? The fact that they self-inspect, and how about the prisoners we don't get? We don't get anything. There's one other thing that nobody talks about. If Israel ever attacks, if they ever attack Iran, there really is a clause in there the way I read it, and I'm pretty good at this stuff, we're supposed to protect Iran from Israel. I mean, we're supposed to fight Israel. So That's not going to happen. We're supposed to fight. How do they allow a clause like that in there? Hmm. So it's a horrible deal. With that being said... I will police that to a level that they will not believe even exists. So Hassan Rouhani just uh, said something which, uh, about the GOP, insulting pretty much all of you. He said, uh, when some of the, what the Republican candidates are saying are laughable. He said, I'll quote him, some of them wouldn't even know where Tehran was in relation to Iran. Some of them didn't know where Iran was geographically. And that's pretty harsh. Yeah, I don't know who he's you, talking about. So but, you but would can know I where Iran is on a map. But, what do you say but, to him? but let me just tell yeah. you what I said to him. They have so out-negotiated our people, because our people are babies. They have no idea what they're doing. I don't know why Obama wanted to make this deal so strongly, because he lost on virtually every point. They will find out. I know he's not talking about me. They will find out that if I win, we're not babies. There's no more being babies anymore. Who's One of the great compliments. Well, you got so many of them that do it so poorly that didn't expect to do. Rand Paul is doing horribly. You know, he was supposed to be a, a leader, and he's down to 2%. Uh, mm -hmm. You have so many. A guy like Marco Rubio is a lightweight. I can't imagine that he goes anywhere. You have, who, by the way, has the worst voting record in the United States Senate. He's got, got the worst voting. attendance record. You can't do that. You've you got to vote. You know, people elect you to a position. You've got to vote. Uh, Bush, sadly, I mean, he's, I think he's a nice guy, but he's doing very poorly. I mean, all of these people. The interesting thing is everybody that's attacked me, Bobby Jindal, um, Perry, every single person that's got Senator Lindsey Graham. I mean, in South Carolina, I'm at 34, he's at three, and he's the sitting senator from South Carolina. But all of these guys are out, even Walker, and I think he's a nice person, but he attacked me, I attacked him, he left the race. So, so far, attacking me has not been a good idea. I'm not saying they it's shouldn't do now. it. <laughs> Well, so far it's been, I mean, seriously, five people, every single person that's attacked me is either gone or, I mean, they've either collapsed. Like in the case of Bush, he was at 22, 24, now he's at six or five or something. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. Look, I'm doing this simply, I want to make America great again. I'm really good at things. I do get along with politicians. I w believe it or not, I have a great temperament for this kind of stuff. They do respect me. In this building, I have some of the largest Chinese banks in the world, and they're very happy to pay me rent every month. And yet I'm very critical of China, which is sort of people how can that be? He's so critical, and yet he's got... So when people say the temperament question, this is a guy who'll call someone a loser, he'll say something, and they say that well, that's childish. But they say that that's childish. Right. They say that's not the temperament of a president. Probably it's a little childish, but you know what? This is a campaign, mm -hmm. and usually, and I think you know this better than anybody, I'm responding to them. I'm a counterpuncher. I think in every single instance I've hit, for instance, Walker was very nice to me. All of a sudden, he hit me, and I hit him back. Uh, all of these guys, uh, Rubio was very nice to me. Couldn't have been nicer. All of a sudden, a week ago, he started hitting me. I so you're saying I, you're not going to talk about Vladimir Putin no, calling him a loser that. or something I'll, like that? I, I actually president? say the opposite. I will. I guarantee. I think I would get along very well with him. We were both on 60 Minutes last night. Mm -hmm. Putin and Trump. 
and it was interesting. I think I'd have a good relationship with him. We have a horrible relationship with Russia right now. We have a horrible relationship with China, even though he's here now. And, you know, look, what they're doing to us is amazing. What China is doing to us is one of the great thefts in the history of the world, what they've done. They've taken our jobs and our money. And now we're whining and dining them over in Washington. And I don't mind that, but they have to understand, we have to renegotiate. We cannot continue to have U.S. trade deficit with China of almost $400 billion a year. We can't do that. That's going to end. Mm -hmm. If I'm there, that's going to end. So yeah. I think my temperament is great. You know, I built a great company, and it's because of my temperament. Jeb Bush and Hillary, almost in the same day, they said, we don't like his tone. I said, tone? They're chopping off heads. They're drowning people. We have people in the world that are looking to kill us. We need a strong tone. We don't need that soft, soft group of people. We need something tough. I think I have a great temperament. Now, for Donald Trump, former President Bill Clinton raised eyebrows over the weekend because he did just that in an interview on CNN. So I asked Trump about Clinton's comments when I sat down with him earlier today. So Bill Clinton, obviously, you could be running against his wife if you yeah. are, are the nominee. He was asked about you this weekend on CNN. He, he said you're a master brander. He said you have a lot of pizzazz and zip. And when he asked whether you could be the nominee, he said, I think so. Obviously, he attended your wedding to, to your wife, Melania. You have known him a long time. Um, what do you say to him? I mean, would you go so far as to say he's a friend? Well, I'll tell you, no, I haven't spoken to him in a long time. And actually, he wanted to know what I was going to do. And, you know, it was a long time ago he called. That was the last time I spoke to him. But I haven't spoken to him for a long time. I always respected him. I've actually liked him over the years. But when we look at what's going on in mm -hmm. the world, when we look at the job that Hillary did as Secretary of State, she goes down as perhaps the worst Secretary of State in history. And when I run against her evenly in the polls, I'm doing very well against Hillary and beating her. Uh, probably, though, I will tell you, you're talking about the Iran agreement. I think that Kerry is maybe going to take her place as the worst because of this agreement. I think it's going to go down as the worst agreement in history. But as far as Hillary's concerned, number one, if she gets to the starting gate, which is questionable because of the email situation, it really is to me a big question. But I don't think she'll be very difficult to beat. People Why? want Why it because think I think she's, she's done such a poor job as Secretary of State. She's done the worst job in the history of this country as Secretary of State. Aaron, if you look throughout the world mm -hmm. during her reign and the reign of Obama, the whole world is blowing up. Mm -hmm. We've lost our friendships. We've lost everything. The whole world. We're talking about Syria. Yeah. These were things that we wouldn't even be questioning. So many bad, Libya, and so many bad decisions were made. Go in here, go into Libya. Now it's a every place that we've touched every single place we gave up on Egypt we didn't back people on Egypt the people that were relying on back and so many things that we've touched the way I look at it everything I mean nobody can tell me one thing that's been done in the last six years foreign policy wise that worked out so so in the polls you're the front runner right you're the front runner yes. of the GOP when they put you head-to-head -head with Hillary though and in our, our latest poll you still lost by a little bit why well, some of the GOP candidates yeah. didn't well so no, no, what, what would you me. do to turn that around but in other polls other than the CNN poll I yeah. beat her uh, I don't I think I just have to do my thing see I'm not interested right now in that aspect right now so I'm running against a certain number of people mm -hmm. and you have to get there first I think Hillary in a certain way is going to be easier than anybody else, but in most of the polls I beat Hillary, and I, I just, I view, look, I have a certain number of people that I'm running against right now. One by one, they drop out. David Gergens.